join us as they are. So um, welcome everybody. Really great that, that you're here. Uh, sending greetings to you all and to the, the lands that nurture you. Um, we're really excited to be sharing some of the work that we've been doing at the Amazon Sacred Headwaters. And um, my name is Udi Mandel, and I'm going to be more of a kind of like a host and, uh, and, and facilitator in the end for some questions. Um, and uh, uh, my, my friend, colleague, Juan Manuel Crespo is going to be doing uh, most of the talking. Juan Manuel has been the key coordinator of the bioregional planning uh, for the Amazon Sacred Headwaters. So he's going to share his the work and the experience that he's had over the last few years in, in doing this work. But also just at the beginning, just to say that we envision this as um, the session is, is one hour long. So we're going to do probably about 35 minutes uh, of, of presenting and then leave time for conversation and questions discussion afterwards. But we also have a uh, follow up session on Monday at the same time which is a little bit longer and that one's designed more as, a, as an open space where we're generally seeking also uh, contributions, shared experiences, uh, reflections from people who are doing similar kind of work specifically around this issue too of uh, processes of monitoring, valuation, learning accountability at, at the level of bioregion, which is one, one, one of the topics that we're gonna be talking about today. So if, if you are interested uh, in following this up, please join us again on Monday, then there'll be more time to hear from, from your, your experiences uh, and thoughts around this as well. But we will have uh, about 20 minutes of time at the end for conversations and, and questions. So uh, without any more of ado, I'll pass it on to Juan. Um, and um, and then I'll, I'll add a, a tiny bit at the end. So, Juan, you want to take over? Thank you, Udi. Uh, and good morning, afternoon, uh, wherever you are to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to, to be here with you, being part of this amazing summit. I think that this is a wonderful space in which we, all we are all learning from it, so I'm very happy to be part of it and to share with you the process that we have been building and lifting from, from this small, small little bioregion in the Western Amazon region in, in between Ecuador and Peru. So it's great to, to be with you. And I will try to focus my presentation mainly in, the, in all the process that we have been building uh, through the bioregional plan that was the like the main tool that we have been lifting the last three years more or less uh, and also i want to share you with you where are we now and where are where are our main challenges for the coming future in the short term and also in the in the long term so it will be great to have your feedback your ideas your questions and and we'll be lifting a collective intelligence uh, space. So I will share my screen now for a presentation that we have prepared with Udi, um, uh, which is, uh, that's about our alliance. I want to begin with that. Uh, all these faces that you are seeing here are uh, the reason that of what we are working and with who we work. Uh, these are the people that defend this bioregion, that lives in this bioregion. And these are the people with who we work daily in a, in a big challenge and struggle that we, have, that we have to face in the future, in the coming future, but also in the present. So, um, well, this is, our, this is our session called Bioregional Planning. Uh, measuring evaluation and learning in the Amazon Circuit Headwaters Initiative. As Judy present us, um, I'm Juan Manuel Crespo. I have been part of the, of the technical team that coordinate the, the, the bioregional planning uh, process. Um, and I want to begin with uh, uh, giving you a, a small, a very detailed, uh, small detail of the organization that are part of this alliance. Uh, almost all of them, uh, are indigenous organizations of Peru and Ecuador, 
in the Peruvian Amazon and Ecuadorian Amazon, uh, and also uh, organizations, civil society organizations such as Pachamama Alliance, Fundación Pachamama, Rainforest US. So uh, in, the, in the beginning was also, uh, this was lifted by Amazon Watch and the stand uh, were part of the standard earth. Uh, we're, now they are allies of us, but they are not part of the, of the, of the central core of the organization, but they are uh, important allies for us. Uh, this, this initiative was, was built in, the, in, the, in 2017, following an urgent call from the nationalities and indigenous peoples of Ecuador and Peru to permanently protect a mega diverse by region of more than 35 million hectares uh, in the Western Amazon. Uh, the importance of this by region is that the 60% of it is composed of a mosaic of protected areas and indigenous territories. So it's a, it's, it's a very uncommon by region in the, in, the, in the Amazon with these characteristics. Uh, so these initiatives basically have lifted in, this, in these recent years, this tool of Aboriginal plan that articulates realistic and viable solutions to address the economic and social challenges that the, that the region is facing so far. Um, this is a quote of an article that, that was uh, published in The Guardian that was described this, this by region as a cultural and ecological gem. It's considered the terrestrial ecosystem with the greatest biodiversity on the planet, maintaining the hydro hydrological cycle of all America helping to regulate Earth's climate. Why, am, why are we saying this? This is a, a study made by Bas and, and their colleagues in 2010. Uh, they, they made this, this study in the whole uh, Amazon biome, analyzing the different uh, overlaps of diversity, especially between uh, groups of animals, plants, and every, every being in the Amazon. And it's very interesting that they found that the main hotspots of the Amazon were in this western side of the of, of the Amazon. This is not a is not something uh, uh, aleatory. This this has a lot to do with the connection between the Andes and the Amazon. This is the particularity of this bioregion. That is the that's why we call the the, the sacred headwaters. These, these headwaters of the Amazon are very important in the different ecosystemic floors that it creates because of the altitude. So that's why the main hotspots you will find in this area, especially this, this corner, where the, the Ecuadorian uh, latitude, the Ecuador la uh, line is, is draw in the, the, the latitude zero, and the Andes and the Amazon gets together. So this convergence of these different dimensions make it the, the, the hot spot of, of biodiversity in the whole Amazon. And also this, all this corridor that you see in the, in the lower, in the southern part of this bioregion, this is the bioregion uh, of sacred headwaters, uh, is, is all the, all the con interconnections of ecosystems, uh, hydrological ecosystems that, that flows through, from the western to the eastern side of the, of the Amazon. Uh, here you can see just a quick a quick slide of the alt, of the altimetry of the of the bioregion just to give you some context of what kind of bioregion are we talking. We we begin in the in these big uh, peaks uh, of the of the Andes at six thousand meters of altitude, and it goes down into Iquitos more or less, which is uh, more or less at, at five hundred meters of altitude. Uh, so you can see this, this range of altitude is what makes it so particular to this bioregion. Uh, here you can see the uh, hydrography of, of, this, of these basins of the bioregion. Uh, there are lots of big, of big uh, basins. And most, the most special thing about this is that the, the, the most important rivers and basins of, of the, that converts into the Amazon River comes from this, this range of the Andes. So the Napo River, the Tigre, Pastaza, and Marañón uh, are born in these, in these sacred headwaters. So these are some of the different ecosystems that exist in this bioregion. And this is, for example, the carbon absorption of the bioregion, which is also 
right now in the discussion of the of climate justice is going to have a, an important role so it's important to know that we we have like make some good analysis of how, how much carbon it can it can it can absorb this all this bioregion we have an approximation we we don't have a a particular uh, study of it because it's very very difficult to to do it in such a big bioregion but we know that this is more or less the the capacity of absorption um, but this is the most important thing about this bioregion and that's why we this is a this is an initiative that was born of the indigenous peoples and that is meant to 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 exist because of them and and they are the the, the core of of our initiative uh, this mosaic of more than 30 peoples and nationalities is a is a wonderful rainbow of of diversity that inhabits this bioregion and that lives together they they live in a, how we call in 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 our in our in our countries a buen vivir in the amazon the well-being of, of the amazon so it's this is the most important aspect of the bioregion and that's why uh we are so proud of being part of it because this 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 represents the the great challenge that we have uh, in in front of us. Um, so now I'm going to get into the plan, the the, the original plan. Um, what was the approach that we made with this tool that we tried to to build was that uh, the 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 focus and the approach of a original plan recognizes the interconnection and interde interdependent ecological functions and process that are essential for the health and integrity of a region as well and same as important of the, sh the cultural shared economic historic and geographic characteristics that define this region so there is the ecosystemic interconnection and interdependence of the of the ecological functions but there's also a cultural and economic historic and geographic uh, interconnection and interdependence of the of the people that live there, especially the indigenous peoples, the peasants. Uh, so it's very important that we focus in a tool that has this in mind. The other thing of, of for us of having this approach was that bioregion bioregionalism demands a change in values and in the ethics and mentality of the planners, the technical teams, and everyone that is involved in this process. So we have to shift from an anthropocentric vision that is usually what, what domains in the, in the business as usual and in the development paradigm to an ecocentric vision that puts life in all its forms and, and, and human and non-human beings in the center of our concerns and our objectives. So this was another important aspect of this approach. And finally, and but not not less important again is that the indigenous peoples and other local communities that live in this very region must be the ones that lead the process that we, this means that they are in the center of the decision making of the of all all the aspects of of the different dimensions that we have to to do so how we build this was a long 18 month uh, construction process with different workshops of, with the, with our organization that are part of the alliance. Uh, more than 50 people were included as editors, consultants, expert technicians that were part of all of this gathering of information, uh, discussion, feedback, processing, uh, edition, graphic, mediation, everything that we made in this process. And it was very rich because we, we didn't want we didn't want and we didn't need to begin from, from scratch. We have a lot of process in the terrain in the territories that are the living plants that they as, as they call the, the indigenous peoples they have their own living plants in their territory so what we made really was to compile all these living plants in one way or another and try to make a, a bigger picture where every, every each of these plants could come together and be part of this great vision that articulates these different living plants of each territory. So it was a great challenge, but was very, very um, rich in, in what we, we, we made during the process. We, have, we, we were doing this during the pandemic. This was a, a great challenge in terms of 
of the capacity of doing workshops, we have to, to ask the, especially the, the people that live in the territories to, to connect to uh, internet, to have connection and was a, was a difficulty, but at the end, we managed to, to, to raise a, a very interesting process in these 18 months uh, of, of, of process. And just to give you a big picture of, of the main purpose that, that came across with, uh, with the process was that the, the proposal, the main proposals that we, that we lifted was were around the strategies for a post COVID recovery. We were living in that moment, the, the, the worst part of the, of the pandemic in the Amazon. A lot of people were dying, uh, old people, elders, wise people. Uh, so it was a very difficult moment to, to, to have like a positive vision of it. But at the end, we, all, all of our discussions were around how to go through a just socio-ecological new deal, something like that. Like what kind of, of alternatives uh, of, of actions or strategies we can go through to give a, a, a paradigm shift. So there was a lot of, of different ideas around uh, basic income, uh, about uh, external debt relief, debt swaps, fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty, mining moratorium, well-being indicators, among many others. And also uh, another big proposal that came across was the, uh, the look, the, the, the advocacy to, to, to bring a great, a big agreement between different actors that have something to do with this bioregion, for example, states, indigenous and civil society organizations, enterprises, companies, private companies, financial institutions, and try to bring all of them into, towards an idea of uh, a declaration of permanent protection of this, of this key bioregion of limits of extractive industry. So this was a, a great proposal that, that, that we were trying to lift also. Uh, a third one was the, the need of legalization for more, more than 9 million hectares of indigenous lands that are, are in, currently on demand from these organizations that are part of our alliance. Uh, and this means to, to complement this with a strengthening of indigenous governance over the lands and territories, especially in our countries. Uh, we, we have a lot of studies that show, shows that the, the most conserved and better conserved areas in the whole Amazon are the areas that, that are property of indigenous, indigenous uh, nationalities. So this, this is, not, is, is not a political perspective. It are facts and studies that demonstrate this. Almost the 80% of biodiversity of the whole world is in, land, is, is in hands of indigenous peoples. So we know, we know that. So it's a moment that we need to recognize their property and their and their and of their lands in a in a more legal way so this is a big big challenge that we have in this plan also we have to ensure a buen vivir a well-being in the whole amazon not not just indigenous peoples also there are cities that live there there are peasants there are a lot of different populations that live in the amazon and we need to improve their living conditions while maintaining biodiversity and culture we we this shouldn't be a dichotomy between, ah, well, we need to, to make better conditions for the people, so we have to sacrifice biodiversity and culture. And this is something that we are not, we're not, uh, we don't want to, to encourage. We, we think that we can do it both. Uh, so this is, this is our approach. And there was also a study about, we, we identified which areas are most important in terms of prioritization of protection. We have identified 20 million hectares of the 35 million hectares of the whole bioregion that we need to, that are unprotected and they are high biodiversity tropical forests. And we also identified the need of restoration of key 8.7 million hectares of forest needed to maintain the landscape connectivity, especially where, what I began the presentation, the connection between the Andes and the Amazon region. This, this connection, this ecosystemic connection is very fragile and is very, very important for the, for the surviving of this bioregion. Not only the, the sacred headwaters bioregion, but the whole Amazonian biome, because this is the main, the main headwater of the, of the Amazon basin. So 
this is what important uh, important identification and last the last uh, big proposal that we made was the creation of a sacred headquarters fund jointly managed by indigenous organizations civil society government and the social responsible private sectors aiming to ensuring the health and well-being of the amazon peoples and ecosystem so this is the big picture of what we we did i would just want to summarize this a little bit and just to give you an idea of the context i'm going to focus in the current situation what's happening right now uh, here you can see a map of the of the forest loss in the uh, in the Ashi Bayou region in the last 18 years from 2000 to 2018. You can see how how much all the red points are the deforestation uh, in this in this area, and almost all of them are linked to extractive industries. So this is very important to 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 know that this is the main cause of deforestation. Uh, 600,000 indigenous people are living in this bioregion. region and we we know that the the these these areas these light green areas are the indigenous territories so you can see this link between between indigenous territories and non deforestation areas here is very clearly you can see in this all this area of ecuador is still like un, un, uh, untouched by deforestation and also in peru because of the indigenous populations. So what, what else is happening? The extractive industries are threatening this area very hardly. Uh, you can see oil, oil industry in this area, mining industry in this area, illegal mining in this area of the right. So it's an important threats that we are facing right now. Also infrastructure implementation is threatening the ecosystem connectivity. These are roads that are being planned. All these are roads that are being planned. And all of these black, I don't see, if, I don't know if you can see well, but they, these are roads that are already built. And deforestation, again, is very connected to, to, to infrastructure. Also waterways in, in these great rivers, Marañón and Napo especially, uh, they want to, to drag the rivers and, and it's going to have a lot of impact. And hydroelectrical dams also, especially in the Marañón River, are, are great, great threats. Uh, the social inequality in this bioregion is, is amazing. Uh, the impover, impoverishment of this bioregion, also, not only in Ecuador, but also in Peru, the Amazon of Ecuador and Peru is the most impoverished area populations in, in each country. So it is very ironic that here is where the extractive industries take all the richness and all the poverty is given is lifted in the in the population that live there. There are also educational gaps, health problems, obviously the COVID-19, I put this slide because it was a great impact and was was a, an important moment that visibilized the, the current situation. And the violation of collective rights and cultural impacts is, is something that we are facing each day. But this is the proposal. We, with this plan, are trying to get out of this, of this business as usual. So these are the critical notes that I, I've been mentioning. This is leading us to a tipping point of the Amazon. Here is the tipping point. You can see that um, in this graphic, the 2020 is a moment that is leading us to a tipping point is this black area, but we are proposing a transition paradigm, a paradigm shift that means to begin with a maintaining fossil fuels underground, uh, especially in areas of high ecological cultural value, create new metric systems. This is a key issue for analyzing and giving different approaches to well-being. What is well-being? Extractive industries is well-being or is not? And, and these indicators we have to change somehow. And we need to support economic alternatives in the terrain. These are the big, the big, the big uh, picture of how to, where to begin with, okay? So this, this is the idea of the vision that we, we build in this plan. Um, so this is the, the vision of a 10 year plan that we propose. Uh, the, the, our idea is that we envision that in 2030, the Amazon sacred headwaters is permanently protected and restored as a living bioregion. It is inspired by indigenous people's forest stewardship, vision, and practices. 
And in 2030, the people and forests that are flourishing within a prosperous and inclusive well being economy. The region is contributing to reversing global warming and biodiversity loss and is an inspiring model for a just ecological transition. So we build this, these big objectives of this, uh, like stop extractive industries, eliminate degradation and forest loss, ensure indigenous territorial governance, and promote forest uh, conservation and restoration, uh, and consolidate Amazonian well being. Uh, with this, we begin like a we, we like articulate nine big pillars of action that we think that are the key elements that we need to activate and implement in the terrain. So you will see, for example, these transition pathways, which is a, the first pillar of, of our proposal, uh, which means a new relationship of the Amazon with the world. So how, what's, the, what's the relationship with the no global north, with the global south is going to continue being uh, an extractive uh, model, or we are going to begin a different kind of economy that's based on, 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 li on life, so a bioeconomy and so, so other. Uh, we're going to promote territorial governance and indigenous self-determination. This is another pillar. I'm not going to go in deep because of time, uh, but these are, I'm just going to mention the big pillars to, so you have an idea of what are the proposals of this plan specifically. Uh, we have a transport connectivity and technological sovereignty pillar. Uh, how, how are we going to build? This is a photograph of a, a solar boat that is being built by indigenous people uh, in the in, in natural territory. Uh, this is an ongoing project that is a, is a, a way of technological sovereignty that we are pushing. Uh, we have renewable energy also pillars. Uh, we have education and ecological consciousness. In, and intercultural health in the terrain, uh, like having all the all the promotion of forest wisdom, um, bilingual education, established intercultural schools, forest knowledge, university, all these kinds of, of ideas around education. And also in, in health, we, we, we think that we need to, to create spaces where all the bio knowledge that, that the Amazonian people has and should help their own people in these terms, right? We also have a pillar of resilience for Amazonian cities. Urban cities are getting bigger and bigger each year. So we have to face the, the, this, this need of, of having a different kind of cities in the Amazon. And we also have a forest economy and food sovereignty pillar that's all these new economies that we have to push and, and give more importance. Uh, and also the pillar of conservation and restoration in the headwaters. This is obviously a, a main pillar. So this is the, 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 the main proposals of, the, of what we built. This was the tool. Uh, and I, would, I just want to finish my, my, my presentation, just giving you some ideas and Udi will complement me in this. Uh, where are we now? Where are we now? What are we doing? We are trying to, to implement all these theoretical ideas, but we are, we are in the terrain right now trying to implement these ideas. So uh, for example, I just want to show you some of the prioritized pilot projects that we, uh, we are pushing in the, in, in the bioregion. Here you have an ecological um, ecotourism, you have bioeconomy products, you have territorial monitoring of the forest. So just to give you uh, uh, some ideas of it. Uh, we are measuring and evaluating. We, we are building tools to, to, to measure and evaluate what's happening in the terrain. So we have lifted a GIS platform that is, is we're working on it right now, really. But I, I just wanted to give you some screenshots of what kind of analysis we are doing. Here you, you can see the conservation areas that we know that are in hands of indigenous territories. So we, we are measuring how much uh, a, a zones of, 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 of conservation prioritization is in hands of, of indigenous peoples. Here we analyze the, the legality of the, of the property of, of indigenous territories. Are there in hands of the indigenous? What are their claims here in the right? The red zones are claims and demands of the indigenous territories. So you can imagine the big, the big zone that we could protect if we, if we uh, legalize these indigenous territories. 
So these are just a ways of analyzing the information. We also analyze demographic information. We have a lot of data about uh, number of populations, indigenous, non-indigenous, where are the, the main populated areas in the, in the zone. So we use maps, we use dashboards, these kind of tools to analyze. We also have like an observatory of threats of extractive industries. This is something that I'm very worried, we are all very worried about. These are great scale mining projects in the frontier between Ecuador and Peru. And you can see these are two in, in this zone, uh, this zone in the circle is this, in this photograph in the, in the right. You have two great scale projects in the mountains uh, one is Condor Mirador and the other one is Fruta del Norte. that are 20 kilometers apart each other. And you have very important threats of uh, uh, tailstock, uh, tailstock buildings that are going to, to be broken uh, in any moment because this is a very seismic area. So there are a lot of studies that, that we have pushed and we have been part of it that shows the, the kind of uh, impact that this, this the, 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 um, the tail, sorry, I, I missed the, the word, but this, this tail stock breaks, all, all this zone you can see in this map is going to be affected by mining polluted waters, uh, residual waters that are going to go into the Marañón River, going to be even to the Amazon River, uh, so all these populations that all these indigenous territories are going to be impacted by, by this collapse. So it's, very, it's a very bad news. So we have to continue monitoring and evaluating the impacts of these kind of industries. Uh, and also, and this is a big part of our main challenge that we have in front of us, is how to build Buen Vivir indicators. We, we are thinking about the Buen Vivir index that we are, have been trying to, to live. And so we are using common like traditional indicators and we're trying to build alternative indicators to cross over and, and try to build this, this idea of a well-being and when we index. Uh, so we are using also in this tool. So I will finish right now my presentation. Uh, thank you for your patience and attention, but I want to give the word to my colleague and partner Udi to share with you some of our big questions that we have in front of us, our big challenges that we are that we're facing right now and to open our, our next conversation. So Woody, I'll leave you here with the next steps and main challenges that I, we, I, we have in front of us. So thank you very much. Great, thank you, Juan. That was, that was amazing synthesis of an incredibly thorough and complex uh, work on a, on a vast scale that's been going on. But thank you. That was really, really a great, great summary. Um, so just, uh, I just want to finish off on, on this slide, which uh, Juanma mentioned is where we are right now and, oh, and the main challenges that we're facing. So what one key thing to address is just like the bioregional plan was a, a, a way of working and an attempt to work in a more participatory way with with the territories with the communities to really create a plan for for the territory for this uh, amazon 2030 vision in a similar way we're thinking now too about how might these uh these systems these processes these tools of monitoring and evaluation also be done for learning uh at, at a bioregional level for learning collectively uh, in the territories and in the bioregion as a whole. So the, the big question that we have is how do we involve communities in this process, both in terms of the of the design and in implement, implementation of a, of a new kind of uh, monitoring, evaluation and learning process. So as, as uh, Juan mentioned, one key aspect of this is this move from uh, an anthropocentric approach, which very often monitor evaluation systems do have to a, a more ecocentric Approach. So the paradigm shift, as as have been attempted in other models too, is is moving away from a, a strictly very economistic approach to to metrics. You know what what are the things that you're looking at um, to one that it's much more holistic, uh, which in, in our case is centered around uh, Buen Vivir and and the 
and the multiple ways this is articulated by uh, the different indigenous communities in the territory. Um, so that that's obviously a big challenge because then it, it's about also um, taking on board what the communities themselves consider as uh, as important, as valuable, uh, in terms of also different things to observe and look out for. Um, it, it also means uh, looking not just at some of the things that Huama highlighted in terms of, of the of the threats, you know, in terms of deforestation or extra extractive industries uh, or, or poverty indicators, but also looking at strengths. So how the communities themselves envision the, the things which are which are strengths in the in the territories in the things that they they observe on the day to day and how can we highlight those and also uh, in a sense you know if you if you if you value it if you uh, have a way of documenting it you show you show its importance and the, the importance of doing that uh, when you're talking about these these monitoring uh, and evaluation uh, systems. Um, one other big challenge that that we face, as as you can imagine, you know, we're talking about a scale of of 35 million hectares. We're talking about uh, 600,000 indigenous peoples and and over a million uh, non-indigenous living in, in in this region. So it's it's a lot of of people involved, and the, it's a it's a large bioregional scale. So uh, think about the innovations that such a monitoring, evaluation, learning system. Uh, has to engage with when we're talking about uh, working at this kind of scale, especially if you're trying to do something that is more uh, participative as well. So that's one challenge that that we are uh, engaging and, and facing. Um, and then the uh, uh, last point is um, how do we shift away the sense of uh, this kind of work of monitoring valuation away from just a, a kind of a technical exercise uh, by, by experts, uh, but actually make it much more democratic and uh, as a as an approach to learning itself so one question that uh, Huama and I have been engaging with is how does the bioregion learn how do you learn, learn bioregionally through these different processes and tools and so that's one one question that we want to uh, leave you all with as well and we will have some uh, we have about 20 minutes now that we uh, want to open up for uh, questions, comments, and uh, and as I said too, we will have more time also to explore in more depth for those of you who are interested uh, to generally contribute and uh, and collaborate on this because we we feel it's a, it's a really it's a great and interesting and exciting challenge and and it's something that takes a lot of different minds and hearts uh, and and kindred spirits to to collectively build. So we we're looking forward to connecting more with, with folks here. And that's one, one of the big reasons that we wanted to take this opportunity to present this, this work to, to you all today. So um, so I have um, the, uh, I'll, I'll be kind of just facilitating and sharing here, but say, uh, Juan, thank you again very much for that wonderful presentation. Um, I would suggest we can, maybe we can stop sharing. Oh, did you want to share something about that? Art oh, um, I would say um, I will open up to questions and comments, and uh, also if people want to, they can uh, add questions on the chat box, and I can synthesize a few questions to uh, well to Huama, and if any I can engage with myself, I I can help out too. So uh, anybody wanna wanna start us off? I'm going to absolutely validate your questions because they are totally the right questions. And we're asking those same questions here in our South Devon bioregion. And just to share with you, our experience of creating the Devon Donut made us very aware that to have a participatory process in which you define what the key scenarios are that are causing harm, and then think about the pathways to action that would, um, reverse that harm or kind of ameliorate that harm. And then to think about where, what are the indicators for those pathways and where do you set the threshold for each indicator and do it completely as a participatory process. So you're, in a sense, you're kind of retaining agency. So these indicators can be narrative indicators. They don't have to be hard data indicators. They can be warm data indicators, but for them to be indicators on which 
there is a clear path for action to take that's linked to the indicator, I think um, confers greater agency on, on communities and civil society. Yeah, I don't know if that's helpful, but we want to go alongside you. We're kind of treading the same path, so we're very keen to learn from you. Wonderful. I think that that'd be really exciting, Isabel, to hear more in more detail. I mean, I know a little bit about some of the work you've done, but it'd be great to set up more further conversations to, yeah. to see more the, the 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 process of that. Okay, fabulous, um, definitely. Uh, I'll take a few more comments, questions, and then Juan, you can you can respond to. Uh, Killian, did you wanna? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, it's, it strikes me that there are kind of two pathways we can go get, take to get to creating uh, regenerative systems, regenerative bioregions, etc. One is to take a, sort of the more modern approach, which is very much what I'm, I'm seeing with, with your system and, and what Isabel has been talking about um, at the little that I understand both of them. Uh, but another one is to simply do regenerative locally, right? So um we there's a in permaculture we talk about building in chunks right and so as each community creates uh, uh regenerativeness and becomes regenerative becomes like a, a part of a quilt if you would like one piece of a puzzle or a quilt and as you build that you just build regenerativeness right and so one way to do it is is take this very technological thing do all the planning do all the the, um, uh, the, the examining and, and testing and, and counting. Another one is to simply on the ground, you do simplicity. And so my question is, is there a parallel kind of process? Because I, I noticed, especially all the um, solar panels and stuff, and I'm thinking, oh my God, these people are already living regeneratively. What is, is there, you know, but we're, but then solar panels and stuff are coming in, which are not regenerative. And, it, it, and it's a really interesting uh, mix to me, but is there a parallel process to just create, you know, help these help communities just sort of protect their lives, one, and two, for new communities, because our populations are growing in, uh, in, in some places at least, um, to create communities that are regenerative and which doesn't really re necessarily require all this. So it's a very weird and interesting juxtaposition of trying to protect from the forces that are really trying to destroy things and raise people up in a, in a sense of consumption that is positive, a regenerative consumption, and then also create new communities that are regenerative. So I don't know, is, what, to what extent is there some process of just simple on the ground uh, 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 regenerative systems being, being put together? or supported, I guess, is maybe the, the word I'm looking for. Uh, Juan, take take that one in a minute. I'm just gonna get Michelle, maybe you have your common question and then we can, I'll pass it to you. Juan, to, to re reflect on that too. Michelle? Thank you for the presentation. I am, um, over the years, I mean, I've followed quite extensively what's happened with both Bolivia and Ecuador as they've moved to the plurinational state, incorporating not just a centralized government, but also the whole incorporation of Buen Viver and the rights of Mother Earth into their constitutions with Eva Morales as an indigenous leader, you know, um, in Bolivia and uh, Korea, in Ecuador, and also with the Asuni, with the whole moratorium on keeping the oil in the soil and trying to raise funds. And I wanted to find out the two questions. The one is the strategies that you are embarking on, the whole debt cancellation. What is, are these strategies that you are seeing that are gaining traction? Because we've had like the, the, the whole keep moratorium, keep the oil in the soil for the Yasuni. And then we've also had the whole Buen Viver within the constitution of both Bolivia and Ecuador. And yet we've seen almost a kind of a sliding back on some of those kinds of thinking um, in terms of, and some of the other external pressures uh, for development. Um, and I'm linking that because I'm from South Africa and from the African continent where we've tried to incorporate some similar strategies on moratorium 
on debt cancellation, on you know some of those very similar. So, I'm, so my question is one: what strategies are finding traction? And then the other is the parallel between what is happening now within the bio region and what we see both in Bolivia and in Ecuador, where we have had an indigenous leader with, with a, 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 and establishing a, a pluri-governance, pluri-national state um, with Buen Viver, with the rights of nature, and, and almost a slipping away from that, you know, some of the pressures and some of the external pressures for that and how you see I mean, is that a risk that you see? How are you managing that sort of a space? So those are my two questions. Thanks, Michelle. So um, Bill, before I, I have your question, I just get, uh, Juan, if you want to reflect. So uh, Killian's question, if you remember, is about the, the common dichotomy of uh, resistance to the multiple threats which are happening right now. And um, this, Gauge of new forms of consumption and other kinds of technologies or, or other things which are arriving, and then Michelle's question both on debt cancellation if, uh, and this move away from plurinationalism and Buen Vivir at the the government level in well I guess especially in Ecuador. I, I can comment too on, on a couple of things if you want to add. Yeah, something to that. yeah, yeah, but. I think that we should like try to not answer. I don't know if I can answer all of that, but just give me give you my my perspective of it. And sure, Rudy, please compliment me. Um, I want to begin with the with Isabel, uh, uh, not question but comment. I think about the the these indicators for the pathways. Uh, this is maybe the biggest challenge that we have uh, because building the right indicators is the key element. Um, someone from the chat like put this that if we 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 were working with COBOL that uh, last year, just just about this. This was the, our key like key central challenge that we have: how how to lift uh, important indicators, but not only important, but the key indicators <laughs> that is not not necessarily we can measure them. Maybe there are unmeasurable indicators, but maybe our quality of life maybe of happiness, maybe of, I don't, we don't know really. This is something that the people that lives in the terrain has to, has to analyze them and think about them. And this is a, a, is a more long process that we need to, to have in, with, the, with the people of the territory that live in the territories. But I think that it will be great to have like a specific workshop of it because it's a very big wide uh, uh, area of, of discussion and and some ideas of methodologies and who should be in charge of, of guiding these kind of discussions would be should be the indigenous people, should be people from outside. We don't know really. It's something that we, we are working on it. And I think that is the biggest challenge that we have in front of us uh, right now. Uh, we, we lifted in, in that moment some of some indicators, some targets really were not indicators, some targets of action. For example, if there were what we wanted to build what kind of what amount of projects of in renewables or something like that but if we are talking about the indicators especially when we need indicators we have to do it with the people in the terrain and we know, we have to have good methodologies and appropriate democratic ways of participation so just to leave there uh to isabel i think that there's a great great uh, workshop that we should do. Maybe not only a workshop, maybe it's a whole life that we can have with that, with that, with that challenge. Uh, about uh, the question about the, this, this, I don't know, duality between modern responses and ancestral uh, technologies, we, don't, we, we think that there's a big possibility of, of action. Uh, we, we don't think that Closing the territories to to a like a more romantic way of thinking the the indigenous territories is a is a, a fit, effective uh, strategy. I think that that's something that we have to be clear that the territories are non they're not anymore unconnected with the modern civilization. So that's that's our key element of where we begin the discussion, right? So use modern technology 
it's okay, but you have to be clear that it's okay only if they are adapted and created for a purpose that is grows from the territory. That's, that's the key element. The, the good processes and good projects that we have seen in the, in the terrain are processes uh, that begins with the right questions of what we need right now. And maybe the answer is the tool, maybe it's a modern technology that we need, but it's not that we begin with the idea that we need to bring renewable because that's the good way to go. No, the, the, the question goes before, the question that goes before is, what we need is maybe we need an electricity at this point of life to have people go to school in a more effective way because education we can do uh, virtual education in some in some areas we can uh, cap build capacities in the terrain through tutorials uh, maybe we need energy and maybe we need internet and maybe or maybe not maybe we can bring computers but not internet and this is a whole discussion about technological sovereignty that's, that, is in, that is an ongoing process. But we have to know that the right, the right strategy is to build with them, build all, every technology that we, we build should be adapted to the necessities and should be the people from the territories who build them. So they, have be, they should be capacitated, they should be like, they should be the, create, the creative minds in, in, the, in the sense of building whatever technology is proposed. And about what are the simple ground regenerative systems that maybe are happening right now? There are a lot of nice processes, especially for example, in intercultural healthcare, there's a, lot of, there's a, a, great, a great project of, that's, that's pu being pushed by Pachamama, uh, that's called the Imana Nukuri, which are like mm, traditional ancestral, uh, Parteras, uh, I don't know what's the, that in the name of in, in, in English. But midway. To, midway, okay. So midway. that kind of approaches are something that is not so complex, but you <clears> have <throat> to push them. So it happens in, in the, in, in effectively. There are also the, uh, it's called the chakras integrales, integral uh, chakras, uh, which is like having these traditional methods of, of, of cultivating uh, food, uh, just by by using like permaculture, but parting from the ancestral knowledge. So that kind of projects are already happening. I think that there are lots of other examples that I don't want to to mention right now. But uh, I think that there are good examples of ancestral technologies that could be complemented by modern technologies. And that dialogue of technologies between modern Modern technologies and ancestral technologies is very, very interesting. And we are pushing a lot of that because we think that there is a key element of decolonization of modern technologies also that we need to encourage. And lastly, just to, to, to answer all the questions, more or less answer, <laughs> comment on the questions, is about this, these of the plurinational states in Ecuador and Bolivia. Uh, Yes, we have a plurinational state in the constitution of Ecuador. Uh, in the practice, it's not so plurinational, we know that. Uh, is, but we also know that to, to action and implement a plurinational state, you have to, to do it. You don't have to ask permission, you have to do it. And that's some, something that the indigenous organizations here in Ecuador are, are taking like seriously. For example, this, this initiative is a way of, of like empowering the plurinational state from their hands. They, they, they demand to the state the legalization and property of their lands because this is the territory of their nationality. So this is a way of, of demanding the plurinational state to be just and to be, and to be uh, like correct in the, in the way of understanding the state. So the plurinational state is not something that's going to come from the from the upper from the upper side of the state you we have to build them from the bottom so this is i think that the initiative of of sacred headwaters is a way of actionating this and also this is very important the the perspective and approach of a bioregion is a plurinational perspective is a plurinational approach because we understand the necessity of thinking the our borders 
in different way. We we don't we don't think that the national state way of of understanding borderlines is is good enough for our 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 time. For example, if we think the territories, the indigenous territories, usually all their borders are ecological borders, are 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 basins or are mountains. Uh, whatever they they see as a limit is 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 linked to the nature so that's also a way of of understanding the bioregion delimitation so it's very interesting to to give that approach to to this discussion of nation state versus plurinational state plurinational state permits you to think from from a bottom a bottom perspective like from the bottom from the territory i can build that state i can at least i can push my rights, because there is a right in the constitution that allows me to, to demand my territory as something that is crucial for my human rights and the nature rights also. The nature has rights in, in, in this territory. So this, this is a key element. Um, Homer, about that, so I don't know if you want to, to compliment. I was me. just going to say it's, it's just come up, um, it's come up to to the hour, but I was going to suggest because I know that Bill, you had you have your hand up, and Catherine, you had uh, your hand up too. That if uh, and I was told by Ben that we can stay a little longer uh, if people want to. So uh, I'll just say if Bill and Catherine, if you do want to make a comment, ask a question. But before you do, just to say too, if people do leave, that we're going to be here again on Monday at the same time, and we can definitely carry on this uh this this conversation and go more in depth and we'll have uh 90 minutes to do it then uh as well so um uh, uh bill or, or, or Catherine, did you want to ask something now I'll, I'll just say really quickly uh uh to respect time um just that the 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 question that isabel brought up about integrating thresholds uh into indicators um, first, we'll be doing a session on that on next Thursday, so I would invite you to do that, uh, and that's about a set of indicators that are going to be released by the United Nations um, on Tuesday, uh, so, you know, right before that session, and I, I worked for the last four years on those and um, would be very interested in, in um, you know, uh, supporting you if, if you're interested in, in taking a look at that, so I'll, I'll keep it brief and maybe uh, drop in on Monday on, on this session as well. Thank you. This was incredible. Great. Great. Thank, Thank you. you so much. That sounds really exciting. Thank you. Catherine, did you want to? Yeah, I definitely will see you on Monday. I uh, have been working in the Sacred Valley of the Incas and um, and working with an indigenous school system there that's K-12 that I think it would be very interesting as a model, they got a UNESCO Japan Award for Sustainable Development. It's a Quechua uh, founded school and works with 15 different communities. Um, and I introduced as part of bioregioning, I kind of got shut down on some uh, early water security uh, convenings I was starting to plan after doing a lot of uh, stakeholder engagement and um, shut down because of uh, water major ca catastrophes that were happening and the um it's the Wilkamayu, the sacred river that becomes the ukayali and um and so what i would love to d dialogue with you about is how can how can we participate in this huge you know water cycle from the peruvian andes all the way down to the amazon basin and some ideas that i've been thinking about how to do patchwork landscapes on indigenous lands to start to um secure the sort of the upper the upper areas that would support you know your efforts down downstream great so, sounds really exciting thanks thanks Catherine. um i think we have uh melina did you want to ask a question too and then um and then we can, we can wrap up in like bueno a mí me gustaría hablar en español <laughs> sofi no sé si pueden traducir al inglés mm. Pero me gustaría aprovechar que estamos hablando de la cuenca amazónica. Have you switched in, to English channel? Eh, para simplemente poner, ya que estamos conectados con la cuenca del Amazonas, darle un pensamiento bien bonito 
a lo que va a pasar este domingo en Brasil en las elecciones. Eh, hay uno de los candidatos que está por tener, eh, que está pro amazónico y hay el otro que lo quiere totalmente destruir. Entonces, simplemente me gustaría que todos enviáramos aquí un, un bonito pensamiento de un minuto eh, donde nos podamos enraizar con esta cuenca planetaria y mandemos nuestros mejores deseos para todos los brasileros y para la Amazonía en general. Que el espíritu del Amazonas nos acompañe, vibre bonito y se expanda por toda Sudamérica y por todo Brasil este domingo y que sea la vida la que prime. Muchísimas gracias. Gracias, Melina. Obrigado, Melina. Obrigado. Obrigado. <laughs> um, so I think we we don't have any other questions or comments. Um, Killian has left. I was going to respond a little bit to him too, but I think you know I'm really excited by the the, the contributions too. And for those of you who do want to reconnect and explore in more depth these questions that we just began to touch on in, in the conversation, uh, please come again on Monday at eight. So thanks for being here and great great to meet you all virtually too. Thanks Juan, that was, that was great. Aloha. Thank gracias, gracias a todos. Thank you all. Muchas gracias. Oops.